Hello and welcome to Discipleship, a Journey of Growth in the New Testament. I'm your host, Pastor Eli Rojas Jr. And today we are going to be repeating a little bit and going into some of the wonderful lessons about the hierarchy of heaven and what it means to be someone great in the kingdom of heaven. So before we begin, let us ask for a blessing from the Holy Spirit so that we can really um, learn and grow through this process as well. Dear Lord, we, we pray that, um, that we learn and that we can have a good discussion, but we also pray that your Holy Spirit will inspire us, that will shape us and guide us through this process, that we can not just uh, gain more knowledge, but also become better disciples. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, jumping to all the lessons that we've already covered. This is lesson four out of seven lessons, but the uh, lesson four is our biggest lesson because this is where we go piece by piece through the three and a half year uh, education that the disciples had. Uh, I think my master's program was about two and a half years. So, um, and so we can see that the disciples kind of got a, a master's level education in their time they spent with Jesus. And, um, and there was a lot of wonderful experiences, um, a lot of headaches for them, a lot of misunderstandings, but very, very um, strong uh, lessons that would ultimately change their lives and help them to become the, the people that we read about in the book of Acts and then in the rest of the gospels. And we've covered almost all the lessons. Uh, we've covered already 26 lessons. And we're just going to repeat lesson 26 because we were talking about it yesterday, uh, last week. And it was such a good lesson. And yet, um, because of time, we kind of um, spent only a few, a few minutes talking about it when we really could, you know, all of these lessons could be an entire, not just a sermon, but an entire class. We could have an entire class on what, what was going on with the rich young man. We can have an entire class on, on Jesus, uh, how he, Jesus treated children. All these things can be really understood. And that's one of the things that I love about the Bible is that um, it's almost like a painting. You can look at it and appreciate its beauty. And then you can become really detailed and really study it. And then you can see all the different intricacies in the painting. So it's not like it becomes less beautiful the more you know. It's like the more you understand about the Bible, the more you, you read into the stories and you understand, it starts to become more of a masterpiece mm -hmm. to you. Instead of saying, oh, that's a pretty picture. Now you're saying, wow, I can't believe how much detail the artist put into the facial features. I can't I can't understand the mastery of the brush strokes and the way that um, the light and the perspective um, matches mm -hmm. it. And, and the more we read about the Bible, the more we see the, the master's uh, details, the more we say, wow, how beautiful it is that this story was included and how it paints a picture and how the more we study it, the more we see the details, the brush strokes. And so we could spend, um, every day talking about the same verse um, but we're we didn't get enough and that's that's the problem is you can you can say well there's never enough time to study it but there's also um times where we rush through things and and it's worth our time to go back and and look at it so the rich young man um we're going to read from matthew 19 verses 23 through 27 it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished. Who can then be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. 
Then Peter answered and said to him, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So we've talked a little bit about who this um, rich young ruler would have been. He would have been born into a noble family. Um, you know, he was a rich young ruler in the sense that he might have been uh, one of the other gospels calls him a lawyer. A lawyer. Um, and so he would have been one of the people that were in charge of understanding the Bible, understanding the law, and, and judging based on the principles of the law on different situations. And so uh, he got to where he was probably because of his family connections. Unfortunately, uh, everything was family oriented in those times. And, and you really could only get into certain offices based on who your family was. And for that reason, there was a lot of of uh, strategic marrying and strategic um, kind of family relationships and things like that. But, um, you know, this person is looking at his life and saying, you know, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. I don't think I have anything to really fix in my life. You know, he was looking at the letter of the law and saying, well, I didn't murder anyone today. I didn't uh, have an adulterous affair today. So I'm, I'm pretty good, actually. You know, in fact, I would say that there's really nothing for me to work on. There's really nothing I need to improve upon. And as disciples, we should always see that as a red flag. If you ever look at your life and say, you know, I'm actually doing pretty good. I mean, if I compare mm -hmm. myself to other people, I'm actually doing all right. You know, I really, I really am, I'm, I'm, am a much better Christian than some other people. And you know, I really don't have much to, to work on. Anytime we say that, we should kind of have that little red flag jump in our head and be like, hey, well, wait a second, <laughs> something is wrong because um, that's that's a clear case of self-justifying where we're kind of um, trying to look at ourselves positively and trying to justify our own actions when the reality is that we can always improve. In fact, we're going to get to heaven and we're not going to stop improving. We're not just going to sit on clouds and play the harp. We're actually going to be learning and growing. And a million years into being in heaven, we're actually going to be a million years smarter, a million years better. But then a million years past that, we're going to be improving as well. So there is really never a point where uh, we have nothing left to learn and no way left to grow. So Whenever we have those thoughts, you got to remind ourselves everybody's sinful. So if I don't recognize my sinfulness, it's because I have, I have a plank in my eye. I have something that's blinding me to my spiritual condition. And I need to check that as soon as I can. So this person comes to Jesus and says, hey, so what do I need to do to be perfect? And Jesus tells him, the legal answer, the legal, what the Bible says legally you have to do, which is basically follow the Ten Commandments. And um, so the one version says that the rich and ruler, the, the lawyer um, answer says, oh, yeah, I've, I, I've done all these things since I was a little boy. And so that he was, it's, it specifically says that he says that to justify himself to be like man oh you see that i am perfect i am so perfect that literally the son of god the messiah told me that i am perfect i've gotten god's seal of approval in perfection so then jesus lays the bomb on him says well one thing you lack and that is to sell all you have and give it to the poor and why, why does Jesus say this to this person? And, you know, is that something that all of us should be following? It's like, well, if I want to be perfect, then, then I better sell everything I have and give the money to the poor and kind of um, live, live in, a, in a little hut in the woods or something. Um, why isn't Jesus telling all of us 
that that's what we should be doing, selling all we have and, and giving our money to the poor. Is that what the lesson is in this story? What do you think? Um, if I can answer with a story, Pastor, I I don't know how, how many of you might remember the events that the church had called, uh, they were called NETS, started in 95. And I think it was 2000 that White Nelson did one. And uh, I remember um, I was I was a member, I was one of the elders in his church at that time. I was attending uh, Andrews for my education. And so, so in a prayer, no, not in a prayer meeting, during a worship service, he shared a story that touched everyone. There was a lady who came to him and said, uh, Pastor Nelson, I'm gonna give you a thousand dollars for the net 95. I'm sorry, for the Net 2000 event. No, it was and Net 98, wasn't it? What? Wasn't it Net 98? Uh, yeah, I'm confused now. Either 2000, 98, but it was, it was the one where he spoke. It was the one where he, he was the presenter. And so, so he, he received the offering and then something I, you know, made him ask and he said, well, you know, why are you giving us this amount? And the lady share and said, Pastor Nelson, I don't have any savings. I don't have any money. I live in a trailer home, but I feel so moved by God to give everything I have so God's kingdom can advance and so more people can hear about Jesus that I decided just to give everything I had. Now, in the context of an event like that, that was over $100,000 for sure. I don't remember how much it was, but it was a lot of money. A thousand dollars was just a drop in the in the bucket. He said that for a moment he struggled and said, "Well, you know, maybe I shouldn't take this money and I should just say thank you and God bless you." But then he realized that he will be robbing her of a tremendous blessing, and so he accepted the offering. That of course it wasn't for him. Of course it was for the uh, for the event and all the expenses that went along with that. And that event brought a lot of people. There were a lot of baptisms as a result of that. But I never forget the story because it really moved, moved a lot of people, realizing that this woman who had so little gave everything she had. So many people that have so much usually just give from the what is left over or not even sacrificially, you know. And it, it was a powerful lesson. Mm. We see this in the story of the widow the widow's might where um, you see all these Pharisees coming in and dropping big bags of, of gold into the offering plate. And then Jesus makes a point to point out this um, very awkward, you know, probably hiding from everyone, just trying to give her offering and go. And Jesus ex ex honors her by saying that, you know, she's given more than everyone else because she gave everything, not just, you know, not just the extra that she had or all these things. And so um, that goes with the story as well, where um, this there is a deep um, blessing and a deep, uh, deep uh, joy that comes in in giving, not from not from our wealth, but out of out of uh, putting God first, out of saying, well, even though I could use this money, I'm going to give this money to God because uh, I I would rather sacrifice for God than than live in pleasure for myself, and and um, and that's something that we struggle with because uh, we live in a society where um, one of the main things that they say is you have a right to treat yourself you need to take care of yourself and and you know a happy person is a good christian is a good person and uh, a lot of times our finances uh, speak to how we really think about god and we really think about um the kingdom of heaven because uh without realizing it we're putting our finances 
where our mouth is. We're, we're saying this is what, this, these are the priorities in my life. And um, depending on how we spend our money, it's, it's actually, it actually shows what's more important. Um, who is the, what is the greatest priority that we have? So, um, so the ideal is to, to be perfect is we need to um, sell all we have and, and give the money to the poor. Is there, is there more to that story or is, that, is this the main point to show us is to be perfect, that's what we have to do? I think it has to do with our focus is not with what we have or don't have, but what the focus is. A poor person can be as focused on money as a rich person and vice versa. Mm. Um, think of Mother Teresa, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. And I see this. Uh, the disciples respond very, very, um, very, uh, they, they kind of like freak out a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, who can be saved? Because if you're telling us that, um that basically rich people which you have to understand that in the time people thought that rich people were blessed by god it's almost the same thing people believe today isn't it true that um where you hear people giving testimony is they're talking about how god has blessed them financially and how god is helping them financially and we don't realize that um, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago in the in the camping trip. We talk about the idea that there could be sat satanic blessings and there can be godly trials, <laughs> and we we often confuse the two because we'll think that something positive has to come from God, and we'll think that something negative has to come from Satan. But it's all about where it takes us because something positive can take us away from God and can force us to do things that we wouldn't do if we hadn't accepted those, those uh, temptations. If we hadn't fallen to the temptation, say, well, I want to get paid more. So because I want to get paid more, I have to make sacrifices because I don't want to lose my job. So I'm going to have to work on the Sabbath. I'm going to have to do things I'm not comfortable with. I'm going to have to cross some lines. So, you know, it's like, okay, I, I don't, I, I shouldn't think that everything good comes from God, and I shouldn't think that everything bad comes from Satan. God, God doesn't hurt us, but sometimes we have to go through bad experiences for the blessings that come on the other side, and sometimes we have to ignore good experiences because they will only take us away from God. So it's not so much about um, blessings are, you know, financial blessings are from God. It's almost like um, there's a deeper reality. And it's not just about our money. It's about who are we serving? Who, what kingdom are we, are we serving? And we might be serving the kingdom of Eli more than the kingdom of heaven. Even as a pastor, I could be serving the kingdom of Eli more than the kingdom of heaven, not by how I spend my money, but maybe how I spend my, my free time or how the things I choose to do and the things I don't choose to do. Um, everything, our time, our money, our, our energy tells us who are we serving? Are we serving God or are we serving ourselves? And then using the extra time that we have to serve God, because then we really are preparing our own kingdom and kind of keeping, you know, three fourths of our body in our kingdom and maybe dipping a toe into God's kingdom when really it should be the other way around. We should really be thinking mostly about God's kingdom and then you know, making sure that uh, we're not ignoring the problems of this world. We're not uh, forgetting to pay our taxes and forgetting to pay our rent and forgetting to 
do the things that we have to do in this world, but that, um, you know, we always make sure that the kingdom of God is, is the highest priority. This rich young ruler had fallen into the trap of, well, God has blessed me. So therefore, he, he obviously wants me to, to enjoy this and, and have a good experience. And he's obviously giving me this for myself when, we, when he didn't realize was that um, he was using all of those blessings that God had given him for himself and not using any of those blessings to serve the people around him. And, and that's where he um, ultimately sinned is not so much that he was rich and God doesn't speak anything negatively about rich people, but he speaks negatively of self-absorbed people, of people who have abandoned the kingdom of God to create their own kingdoms. And that happens regardless of um, financial resources. Is there, are there any other lessons that we can apply to our lives from this story? Well, since we covered it, let's go ahead and move to the next story. So the first will be last and the last will be first, the sons of Zebedee. And, uh, you know, you have to remember something very interesting, and that's that these guys were probably Jesus' cousins. Um, so they were related to Jesus. And they might have thought, hey, you know, help us out. You know that we're part of your family. So you need to, uh, you know, take care of us as part of your family. So let's read from Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28. Uh, do I have any volunteers? Um, you can see it on your screens. Would, you, would anybody mind reading it? Just so I'm not the only person that's uh, reading uh, the whole time. I will. Oh, thank you. But Jesus called them unto him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief, among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. So, um, to give the bigger context of the story, we have James and John who are looking to, um, they were always fighting. It's funny, the disciples never stopped fighting. Every time that Peter answers, that is part of the uh, Jewish tradition of the disciples, where the person who wanted to be the first in, in the group always answers first and always answers the latter. So he wanted to assert his dominance by always being the first to answer. And obviously, that leads to ignorant answers. So, you know, Peter would be like, hey, and he would yell out his answer. And Jesus was like, oh, okay, Peter. So first of all, let me explain this to you. And he would kind of have to, but Peter's answers were typical. Uh, that was the response typical of someone who was trying to be the first of the disciples because whoever got to be the first of the disciples got to take over the master's ministry after he left, after he uh after he uh, gives, gives well, actually, he gets to start his new school. So the master would keep teaching, and, and he would start his own school. It's like a little franchise of the master's school. So his goal was always to answer first. And all the disciples were constantly fighting with each other. So then um, James and John decide to take advantage of their family connection and they send their mama, who was Jesus's aunt, to come talk to him privately. And uh, she asks him to sit on the right hand. James and John sit on the right and on the left. And Jesus shuts her down and tells her no. But that doesn't stop the disciples from getting furious. 
and and getting really angry at James and John for trying to manipulate the situation. So they start to argue, and Jesus basically puts them in their place. It's like, who wants to be the greatest among you? Who wants to be in first place? Um, basically, in order to be in first place, you have to be the greatest servant to those around you. And that's tough for us today because, um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people who are still bringing the mentality of because I'm a head deacon, because I'm the because I'm an elder, because I'm the Sabbath school superintendent, I am an authority and I have I have an authority to um, be in charge and to tell people what to do and make decisions. And you'll see a lot of a lot of this gets into ministry. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes ministry attracts people who are power hungry, who are looking for validation because they they don't have very important jobs. They don't have very important, um, you know, uh, position in their communities. And so they look at the church and say, hey, this is a place where I could really become the top guy. I could really I could really grow to be powerful and strong and and I can get my validation from there because no matter how bad I am in regular life I could become the head guy and be the head person in charge in the church and I can get my my um, validation from there and the reality is that anyone who thinks that way is automatically uh, disqualified from being a leader anyone who is looking and saying, oh, um, I want to be an elder. I want to be the head guy. And because a lot of times when somebody tells me that, I tell them, well, the first place you need to start is as a deacon or as a deaconess or as, as one of the ministries that basically um, is, a, is serving because there is no greater lesson as a Christian than the lesson of service is that every position that we have in the church is meant to be of service to those around them. It's supposed to be people who are the humblest who say to themselves, um, how can I improve in helping others? What can I do to uh, be a greater blessing to them and not see people as a way for them to be blessed, but as a way, you know, they look at their job and say, okay, um, what can I do in this ministry to benefit other people? And those are the people who are most qualified to be in high positions in the church. Those who would say, basically, um, I just want to serve God and serve my brothers and sisters. And, um, you know, so really the best place to start in ministry is always to start as a deacon or a deaconess, just because they're the ones that probably have to do the most serving jobs. They're the ones that have to clean and have to make sure the lawn is taken care of and, you know, make sure the church is, is well maintained. And once you learn those lessons of service, of humility, then um, God will show the, the, brother, the body of Christ. It will, it will show us, hey, um, this person is is now not just fit to be a servant, but now that they have that servant mentality, these are actually their higher skills. This is what they're best at, and these are places that you can use them in. And so out of that first lesson of humility comes all these other skills, because once you learn to serve and not be served, then uh, you're really in the in a position where the 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 highest office of the church is the head elder or the pastor. It really is all about, it's, it's like you have a greater responsibility to serve other people. That's why um, the conference president um, calls himself the servant leader um, because he's leading the church, but he's, he's doing it not as a king, but as a servant. This is a, a ministry that he does uh, for all the people of the Carolina conference. And so, um, you know, 
even if you're not wanting to be in a high position, how does this, how does this problem of having to serve come into our lives? I mean, if, if you're not trying to be the head elder, then is this really applied to you? But how does this lesson apply to all of Jesus' disciples? What do you think, Ms. Kelly? Maybe they all wanted the same thing. Mm. And that's why they got upset because they beat them to the punch of asking. Oh, that's definitely true. They wanted to be the top dogs. You know, do, do, do any of us, do, is that still a struggle that we have as Christians today? Yes. Yes, to some extent, yes. Yeah, I think that the problem nowadays is there isn't really that many people who want to be in high position. Um, you know, we don't, I mean, there's very few people unless they're a little bit of a egocentric person that wants to kind of, they want to have their badge and say, you know, oh, look at me, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a music director or I'm in charge of something, something, I'm in charge of family ministries or I'm in charge of something. Instead of uh, having that badge, most people really, you really have to push them <laughs> to try to find, to try to get them to help in church and try to get them to be involved. But that's <clears throat> almost the same problem because um, there's very few people who want to dedicate time and effort to serving other people because there really isn't that much glamour anymore in saying you're a deacon or saying you're a deaconess or saying that, you know, you're involved in, in pathfinders or you're involved in, in women's ministry. There's very few people that are like, wow, that's amazing. I, I'm very impressed. It's mostly like, well, I know what you're doing. I know how you're, you're spending your time. It's always nice to have a hobby, but no one's really getting any benefits. And so there's very few people who, who see that much of a benefit. There's very few people who are like, wow, serving in, in ministry is going to be great for my resume. Most of the time people are like, hey, if I'm going to be in, helping in church, that's going to mean that I'm going to have to give up uh, a couple Sundays a month to help out with these things. And I'm going to have to give up my afternoon nap and I'm going to have to give up all these things. And it really becomes the same issue. It's like how many of us as disciples of Christians in the church have made our, our identity about serving others, not just about um, salvation in Christ, but actually the personality of Christ. We know that Philippians tells us, have this mindset that's also in Christ, that being in the form of God did not um, find it, you know, vain to humble himself did not I, i'm mixing the words up now I, I almost had it perfectly at the beginning but basically it says that jesus did not did not uh find it repulsive to humble himself to the form of a human being and not just a human being but actually one of the lowest of the lowest human beings and not just one of the lowest of the lowest human beings but to die on the cross for us um the, the God, God of the universe, the creator of the universe, was willing to make himself like us, which we think of ourselves as so great, but, you know, in the scheme of things, we're very insignificant. We're almost like the, the ants and the grasshoppers of the world, of the universe. But um, he, he humbled himself in order to serve us. That's how he, became, that's why he became a man. He couldn't, he could have, um, he couldn't save us from outside. He had to save us as a human being. And, and even though that was despicable, um, he never hesitated to, to sacrifice everything for us. And yet a lot of us are identifying as saved, as being uh, saved by God through grace and, and, we have our, our victory in Jesus, but there are very few of us who 
are identifying as servants, as people who are dedicating to serving God and serving others. Because even if we don't want to be the head elder of the church, how many of us come to church saying, I'm here to serve. I'm here to help other people. I'm not here for myself. I'm actually here to benefit, to bless other people. And that's a problem that really affects the church in general. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the church is in the state it is today, because we have a problem of the 80-20. We have a problem where 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work, and 80% of people are doing 20% of the work. And um, there's very few people who are willing to sacrifice more than their share of their time, of their money, of their resources, because it, it's painful to sacrifice so much. And yet, um, that's what God is saying to us, is, is we should be servants. We shouldn't come to be served. We should come to serve. And a lot of Christians, they'll come to church and be like, oh, I don't like the way this person preaches. I don't like the way the music is done. I don't like the programs. I don't think they're doing a good job. And that's it. They'll leave and they'll, they won't come back. But that's all about me. That's not about God. That's not about, you know, serving God. It's about what do I get from this church? And that's a problem that lives under the surface, but that affects the entire church. And the more people come to church saying, I'm not coming because the preacher is so good. I'm coming because I have to find a way to serve my brothers and sisters. And this is the best day for me to do it. You know, I'm not coming because the music is great. I'm coming because I have a ministry here to help other people and to make a difference. And I know that even if the music goes well, even if the preaching goes well, I have a ministry to do on Sabbath that can't be done if I'm not there. So that's one of the biggest lessons we can learn as Christians is to be servants and not, not to be served, but to serve. Um, how do we learn how to be servants? What do we have to do? Because it sounds, I mean, I made it very simple, but that's not as easy as, as it sounds, right? What do we have to do to become servants? Uh, if, if I may interject, uh, if you go back to what Dr. Roja said about it, it's all about your how you focus mm. uh, uh, Rob and I had a, a, a short discussion uh, a few weeks ago uh, when he was doing the uh, after he had done the uh, Sabbath school and uh, I, I tried to make the point that that uh, it, 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 it's it's all about why you are serving if you're if you're serving for your own salvation then you're not focused on the salvation of those people that you're serving um, and so it comes back to all about self mm. to get rid of self and focus on on those that you are trying to serve yeah and isn't it beautiful that when we learn that lesson, we really stop need to stop. We we really stop worrying about our own salvation because if I'm so worried about the salvation of other people, then I'll never have to worry about my own salvation because um, by saving others, I'll automatically be saving myself. You know, so a lot of things that we do in order to be saved happen automatically once we stop worrying about ourselves and start worrying about other people. Um, and that's that's something that's hard because we have such a self-preservation mentality that comes from sin, where because Adam and Eve ate the fruit, all of a sudden I have to be worried about how I'm going to survive and what I'm going to do. And we can even bring that into our Christianity where I'm not helping Chuck because I want to. I'm helping Chuck because I feel like if I don't help Chuck, um, I'm going to get struck by lightning and I'm going to go to hell. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that you would appreciate the help either way, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's not really, it's not really affecting my salvation the way I think it is because 
the biggest obstacle to my salvation is, is my self-focus. And even though I'm doing the right things, I'm not doing it for the right reasons. But once I start to focus on doing things out of goodness, out of love for others, out of just serving others, then uh, salvation is almost, um, is almost uh, guaranteed. In the same way that Jesus, uh, Jesus gives the parable of the separating the sheep from the goats and, and God saying, you know, um, come faithful servants, great is your reward. And there's, and he tells them, um, you know, because you took care of, because you fed me, because you clothed me, because you took care of my needs, you can come into heaven. And they're like, when, when did we do that? It's because they had wrapped them, themselves up so much in the focus of serving others that they just eventually um, just they they stopped caring about um, how much they were sacrificing and what they were they were just serving people to help them in their needs and in that process they guaranteed their salvation where though in the opposite example they were worried about their salvation and they were doing all the right things but they had never become servants to the needs of others and so because they had never become servants to the needs of others even though they had been in church even though they had never done evil to anybody because they could say well i never killed anybody i never committed adultery but because they had never become servants to other people that in itself that by itself um disqualifies them for salvation so we almost Come to the conclusion that we can only be saved in that we serve the needs of other people. And as soon as we stop serving the needs of other people, we lose our own salvation. And that's a scary thought. But um, we worry so much about our own salvation that we miss the point and we actually disqualify ourselves because we're so worried about self that we forget the salvation is about serving the needs of others. And once we learn that, then you never have to worry about your own salvation again. So any thought before we move on to the next story? I don't know. I think we have five more minutes. So, um, you know, we might just take a little longer in this section and, and save the next story for, uh, for the following week, even though the following week is uh, the day before um, I think it's the 20, 22nd and we have the, the 24th on Friday and the 25th on Sabbath. So um, we talk about that in a second, but uh, you know, um, what is the biggest obstacle for us in getting rid of self? Because you know, we can get into uh, jargons, but a lot of times, the problem is that um, even if I, even if I know, even if I'm doing the right thing, I'm I'm still doing it out of that fear that I I'm not going to be safe. So, you know, you hear this the story the the parable where you say, okay, well, in order to be saved, I have to help people. So I'm just gonna I don't want to be lost, so I'm just gonna help as many people as possible. Am I still? Um, have I gone from serving them or am I still serving myself and, and in the process serving them? How do I, what do I really have to do to get rid of self? If, if it really is so hard to get rid of, what do I need to do? Well, we've heard from a couple of people. I wonder if Miss Juanita would mind sharing a thought with us. Yeah, I don't want to answer in every one of your questions, Pastor. That's okay. I think we. Um, I think I. I, I don't think uh, she was going to respond just now. So go ahead. Let me let me think about that. <laughs> that's a good yeah. That's fun. Okay. Uh, no worries. Uh, so why doesn't 
uh, Dr. Rojas respond and then and then um, you can respond, Ms. Juanita, if you have a, no problem. Not to put anybody on the spot, I was just trying to get the the ball rolling. Um, but go ahead, Dr. Rojas, what were you, what were you going to share? No, I think I think you. No, the point I was making is that I, I don't want to be answering every single time, <laughs> but um, since you gave me a chance. Yeah, is is the uh, is one of the struggles. The biggest struggles we have is the um, uh, battle against self. And um, today I read a really good um, devotional. Is the devotional for today? Uh, but the book is uh, "You Shall Receive Power," mm -hmm. and it talks about how our our part of the struggle is the surrendering of self and not wanting to please ourselves. So. So when we have a temptation, we can say, um, Lord, help me, I, I'm being tempted. And it says that God will help us. And so, so you know, even when it comes to pride or recognition, you know, um, it, we have to realize that, that um, we can't just go by our emotions and our feelings of, you know, our um, being hurt or anything like that but just surrender all things to God and let God be the one that works in our lives. We're always very prompt to defend ourselves and make sure that everybody knows we were either right or we didn't do it or whatever. What will happen if we were more willing to let God serve instead of us ourselves always speaking up for us, but letting God take action. I think that would be uh, um, amazing. So in a sense, you're almost saying, um, it comes moment from by moment in that in that struggle of how do I respond in this situation? Because I don't think you ever get rid of that. Uh, I think I call it intuition, like that that um, the habit of okay, this is what I want to do. This is what self is telling me to do. And the only way we really learn to get rid of that is by moment by moment. Uh, surrendering to God and 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 kind of allowing God to take us out of that self focus, um, but it's not something that uh, happens in a in, in a word word response. Well, um, you know, Pastor Eli asked, uh, you know, how we get rid of self. Well, I just dig a hole in the backyard and sit in it for a minute, and that's how I get rid of self. <laughs> like, uh, it's hard. It's like, how do you get rid of impatience? Well, you gotta, you gotta go through a, a situation where you have to be patient, <laughs> and, and it might be really painful because patience is one of the hardest things to learn because you can only learn it by having to go through a really, really um, trying time. You you only you can only learn it by having to be patient, and and it's it's like uh, the lesson of selfishness. How do you get rid of, rid of self? The only way you can learn to get rid of self is, is, by, is because all our thoughts are prone to self. All our, our intuition is prone to self. If you ask me what I want to do, it's always going to be selfish. I'm never going to say, oh, I want to give half my check to the poor. I want to <laughs> do this or that. It's always My first response is always going to be like, oh, I want to get a new jacket or I want new shoes. <laughs> and that's always going to be my first response. Until I learn to say, God, I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to be self-focused. I don't want to be full of self. And then we pray and we set, we allow God to to take to give us that the answer to give us the response to take us out of selfishness. And and in that moment, we choose God what God is leading us to, and not just what self is leading us to. So is there any, and there's no uh, easy, easy way for us to get rid of self, is there, Dr. Rojas? Well, it is by filling our heart with God and mm -hmm. seeking him constantly. And that's what this, this uh, devotional said, is, is when we are tempted, we seek God and we do it earnestly. You know, um, I was, I was yes. thinking about, uh, I was thinking about today, um, I went to a couple of stores to return some things. And, and each time I went to the grocery store, I had to wait 
Mm. And then I, I, in the comment that you made earlier about it's a moment by moment thing. And, and, I, and I think that is so true because you have to die, not daily, but die moment, every moment you have to die to your, to, to self, because I had to think when you get it, that, that person um, has to, you know, she's, she, she doesn't have a receipt and, and she's, she, she's, she's trying to return like you probably would too. So, the, and then a lot of times our, like our patience is tested, but there's a reason for everything. There's a reason I, you need to wait. And there's a reason you need to breathe and just, just, Hey, just relax for that moment. And then I was in another line and this person was buying all of these. He, they didn't, he didn't look as if he had money to be buying all of these lottery tickets. And mm. I'm thinking to myself, who am I to say, <laughs> but he's, that he doesn't have money to buy. You know, maybe he's, this is all he, you know, he's hoping for in the wrong thing and just pray for him. And then I, 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 I found myself, this one person, I found myself waiting in line. Then I start praying for it this one person because so it's like it's a moment by moment thing and we yeah. have to live in the moment and die in the moment you know it, and that's that's what came to me amen you know just what you're what you're saying it's is one of the things you have to understand uh one of the biggest problems with suicide and we we think that it's about depression we think it's about um just like fatigue and and you know all these things um but there is the most dangerous time in a person's life is when they lose hope and so it's, it's interesting that you said that with the um with the person who is buying lottery tickets we might see it as being something like oh that's evil that's wrong and and in that sense you know we know it's, it's not a good idea i'm not condoning um, buying lottery tickets <laughs> so I don't I'm not telling y'all it's okay go ahead and buy as many lottery tickets as you want because there are the evils that come with it but what we don't understand sometimes is that for that person that might be the only hope that they have left in their life and that little bit of hope is carrying through them through a difficult time you don't know and so you think you're helping this person out I, I heard a story um, because I by the way, and, and this is something that um, we, we've a little bit over our time, but I think this is something we should know. There is a, a website called ALC dot, I think it's dot org, um, ALC. Let me double check real quick. Um, I have it up here. Uh, ALC Adventist Learning Community.com. That's what it's called. Uh, Adventist Learning Community.com. And there is a million different uh, programs, education things. If you want to learn about Sabbath school, if you want to learn about just uh, any topic in ministry, uh, is, is good for ALC. It's Adventist Learning Community. Um, and, uh, no worries, sister. Thank you for being here. But I was on the site today or yesterday. I did a class, I did a class on ministering to young women. And that's something that, you know, I have to understand my limitation. I can't be, um, what this program is asking because of, um, my situation being a, a single guy, I have to be careful about those lines and I couldn't be it wouldn't be the same mentor as if you know a motherly mentor a female mentor can do more for a, a young woman than a male mentor so there are limitations but they were basically talking about this woman who had been out of the church for a little bit and had come back to the church with the tattoo and the 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 deaconess comes right away and grabs her arm and holds her arm over the tattoo and says I'm so glad that you're here today with this big sarcastic tone without realizing it that her this girl had a story her brother had attempted suicide 
by slitting his wrists. And so he had cut along the wrist and he had this huge scar and he wanted to praise God and kind of take his, you know, turn his scars into a testimony. So what he had done was he had decided to put music notes all along his scars of a song, I think something like Amazing Grace or something that reminds him of God's love for him. And his sister had been so moved that she had gone and done the same thing as a testimony and as a support for him. And without realizing that this woman was attacking this young woman for um, having these tattoo without realizing um, that she was hindering her but that this was a testimony of faith and that it, it was it was not it's not a normal situation where she just wanted something to look pretty she wanted to share in in support of her brother who had tried to take his own life and how many times uh we miss those um lessons because instead of instead of realizing that hope is so important and that faith is so important that it it transcends some of the other things that we hold important you know it's it's not that it makes it unimportant but there are things that are more important than appearance there's things that are more important than those simple uh, boundaries there's actually it's one of the most important things that we need to fight for today in this age is is love is is uh, serving others and it's it's hope it's bringing hope to people and um what we may see as, oh, that person is is wasting money. It could be the only hope that that person has before they uh, to attempt something like taking their own life because they just don't have any hope anymore. And that might be the only thread that keeps them alive in order for God to do something greater in their life down the road. And so as much as we uh, want to uphold the righteousness of God and kind of hold people to a higher standard, we have to remember that um, first you have to know the person. Uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And second, there are greater things in this world than just um, than just the simple cut and dry things. You know, there's there's values that transcend appearance, that transcend all those things, and that we should be um, giving hope to people and not just um, telling them what they should or shouldn't do. I so, think also not be so quick to judge. Mm -hmm. And we are so quick to do that. Yeah, it's, it, it wouldn't take long for us to say, you know, what's going on? And, and once you realize, you know, what if that guy has been spending his money um, on, on lottery tickets and wasting all his money? Um, you know, is there a point to actually getting to know the person and actually uh, realizing his situation and, and speaking lovingly to them and not just assuming that that things are bad and thinking that a harsh word is, is a perfect response? We used to live in a time where harsh words were perfect. They would help protect people. But we're in a generation, we're in a time in, in history of the world that Harsh words rarely uh, help people anymore. Most most of the time, a harsh word does more damage than it does benefit. And a loving word at the right time does greater good than 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 probably even one you know even one harsh word in the wrong time can destroy. Where one kind word in the right time can can. Um, bless and and just uplift and do all these wonderful things. So thank you, Miss Juanita, for your thought. I really appreciate that. Well, I really love these times, and I feel like we struggle to stay <laughs> under the eight the eight o'clock mark. But I've been blessed. Are there anything that you would like to share before we we finish today? Any last thought or any last uh, comment? question. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, keep talking after the recording is ended. All right. Let's pray. Dear Lord, 
help us to be servants of, of you and servants of, of, of one another. Help us to not think of self, that we can learn to, to be, to learn the lessons from the rich and ruler, to learn the lessons from, from the James and John who were only wanting to glorify themselves, the rich and ruler who put his kingdom above God's kingdom. Help us, Lord, to get rid of the biggest obstacle to, to what, it, what we should be as Christians, which is self. Help us to learn to love others and to lift others up and to give people hope and, and, and to share with them the wonderful future that you have planned for them, that we can look at people as, as people deserving of our, of our help, of our time, of our love, that we may become servants to all those around us and that, um, that by serving others, by showing them the love of Christ, they may see our good works and not praise us, but praise God, praise our heavenly father. And, and may, our, may you, may, may everyone who sees us glorify you for what we do. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.